Okay, welcome back to another version of June's 2010 Reading's Exam. We left off at question number 24 here, uh, which is asking, the block diagram below represents a portion of the Grand Canyon, and we want to know what the region is best classified as. So when we look at it, we see uh, two sides of the valley sloping upwards to flat areas on the top. And so when we have this amount of elevation change in the flat top area, then we're talking about a plateau. Okay, question number 25 here. Now we've got a map below that shows four watershed regions in New York State labeled A through D. Well, we know that watersheds, these are where water is shedding off of higher lands and draining down into lowlands. And so we've got these four regions. And the question we're going to be asked is which lettered section represents the watershed of the Mohawk and Hudson Rivers? Well, if you don't know where the Mohawk and the Hudson run relative to New York State, then, of course, you can use your reference table here. We're going to go on page two. And here it is. We got the Hudson Mohawk Lowlands. So, again, lowlands for watersheds. And there it is. Uh, boom, we match that up here, and that's section C. And so that's answer choice three. There we go. Next one, we've got a diagram here that's going to be used to answer questions 26 and 7 on using it. So which uh, shows specific events in the history of Earth from the beginning of the universe to the present. So, okay, checking it out, we've got the beginning of the universe marked here at 13.7 billion years ago and various other times leading to the present, which is at the surface. Looking at the question. Approximately how many billion years after the beginning of the universe did a solid crust form on Earth? Solid crust, okay. Well, we've got the beginning of the universe at 13.7 billion years, and we've got crust begins to form at 4.6 billion years ago. So we want the difference between the two times here to see how long that took. And we know that difference is always a subtraction problem. And if we plug in the numbers there, 13.7 billion years ago minus the 4.6 billion years ago, we get 9.1 billion years ago, or billion years, you know, for that to take place. Okay, bring up this maleficent, and bam, okay. During which geologic era did life first appear on land? Geologic era, did life first appear on land? All right, if you look over here, we see life first appears on land, Located there, we come across, and we see that's basically 0 0.4 or 0 0.5 billion years ago. So what we're looking for then is the reference table page of uh, it's gonna be page eight. What we're looking for. Rotate it back. Okay, and I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here. If we're looking for 0.4 billion years ago, 0 0.4 or 0 0.5, then 0.4.5 billion is really 400 to 500 million. And so when we look, we're looking right in this region, which is all the Phanerozoic Eon, which we can zoom out here. The Phanerozoic having life in it is going to be blown up in the rest of the mark, you know, reference table here, representing a much larger portion of the rest here. But uh, we're looking for the, this time. So we've got 400, 500, and we come across and we see we've got the Paleozoic era and that's what we we're looking for so let's see during which geologic era did life first appear we want paleozoic bam great next ones we've got uh a whole bunch of diagrams representing what looks to be the lake effect snow process questions asking which cross section below best represents the conditions that cause early winter lake effect snowstorms in New York State. All right, the chain events we needed to remember for this was that we had cold air coming out in from Canada and it's gonna go over warmer, late, you know, it's not necessarily very warm, but it's relatively warmer water in the lakes, right? Because the high specific heat of the liquid water allows it to keep its heat you know, longer in the winter time. So we're gonna get evaporation taking place up off of warm water and then that cold air, which moved over the warm water, is going to move over cold land, and we're going to get that air mass cooled to the dew point snow. 
fantastic. And so that is all in a line here. And just looking at the other ones, we got warm air, warm air. So we know that those aren't, that's not what's coming out of Canada at that time of year. This one is all right. It has the, except for one thing, right? It has the cold air. It's got the warm water and it's got the cold land, but it says that there's condensation taking place up off the lake instead of evaporation. So that's what sets one apart from answer choice two. Something uh, worthy of going back and pointing out here, a lot of times what the region's exam will ask associated with lake effect snow is going to be a land area, a landscape area in New York State that's kind of famous for it. So if we go to the landscape regions here, the Tug Hill Plateau, right? this is very, very famous for getting lots and lots of lake effect snow during the winter time as that air mass comes in right here off the lake with the process we were just talking about. So keep that in mind. All right. What we've got for question 29 is we got, uh, we're asked which block diagram best represents the relative direction of plate motion at the San Andreas Fault. Well, if you don't know that the San Andreas Fault in California is going to be a transform fault and know, and know what that looks like, then we can use the reference table here. We're going to go over to page five. And we're looking at this. Uh, San Andreas Fault is right here. And you see the relative motions indicated with the arrows here, one going one way, one going the other. Transform fault looks like this. It's the key. And so when we come down here, we're going to look for the one that looks like that. And there we go right here, choice four. Where are we at on time on this recording so far? Only six minutes or so. Okay, we're going to move on to another question. Which diagram bet shows the grain size of some common sedimentary rocks? Which diagram best shows the grain size of some common sedimentary rocks? Okay, so what we're looking for, we got sandstone, shale, siltstone scattered throughout, and the difference, you know, the smaller to larger works exactly the same for all of them. And so what we're asked to do here is we're asked to classify correctly the smallest to the largest grain size of these clastic sedimentary rocks. And if you don't have this memorized, then we're going to go to the sedimentary rock schema for identification over here on page seven. And here we go. We're looking when we're talking about separating sedimentary rocks by grain size. Again, those are the clastic sedimentary rocks, the ones that are fragmental, made out of pieces. And so the smallest being clay, and that would be your shale. Silt being the next largest, so it's siltstone, sand, sandstone. So we're looking for shale, siltstone, and then sandstone to be the order from smallest to largest of these clastic rocks. And we come over here, and we see shale, siltstone, sandstone in choice number two. Fantastic. 31. Which graph best represents the re relative densities of the three different types of igneous rock? So, three different types of igneous rock. Okay, if we're talking about relative densities, again, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have all this memorized, but in case we're using a reference table here or just want to double check to make sure that we're thinking accurately, if you're talking about igneous rocks and density, if you go to the chart here, right, the lower density rocks, the felsic ones, the lighter colored ones, and the higher density would be the mafic ones. So essentially what we're talking about here with low and high densities, we're talking about separating between the mafic rocks over on this side and the uh, felsic rocks on this side. All right, so rhyolite, andesite, basalt. And we've got, okay, let me just double check the axis here. It's telling increased density. So if we've got, uh, we've got this arrow up high here for density, we're looking for this rhyolite is a, uh, rhyolite is on the felsic side, right? And so that's not accurate. Whereas, you know, if we're just looking for the ones that should be higher to start out with, we're looking for a, a gabbro, a dibase, a basalt, vesicular basalt scoria, basaltic glass, these four. And so when we look here, we want the high one to be one of the ones that was just mentioned. Okay, I see basalt, and this one has got the highest density 
and rhyolite over there we already know that's felsic and that's low andesite then must be one of the intermediate rocks and when we look at the reference table andesite here is in fact in the intermediate zone so we know that we've got all all accurate over here all right and that's the last one on this page so we've done 331 and i think that'll do it for this recording